Give Me Liberty, the poetry of Emily Jane Bronte. Emily Bronte was born on the 30th of July, 1818, the fifth of six children. The family moved here to the parsonage when she was two, and she spent the rest of her life here, apart from brief spells at school and a short time working as a teacher. Emily's first dated poem was untitled, like most of her poems, and is known by the first line, Will the day be bright or cloudy? It was written on a manuscript dated the 12th of July, 1836, just before her 18th birthday. There are three other poems on the manuscript, but as the date is written above Will the day, this is conjecturally her earliest poem. There is a naivety here which disappears from her later work. In the poem, Emily imagines the life of a child being foretold by the weather on its day of birth. She went on to write more than 200 poems in her lifetime. She began to write as a child. Her sister and brother, Charlotte and Branwell, began to write their Angrian stories in the famous tiny books, and soon Emily, with her younger sister Anne, began to emulate them with their tales of the land of Gondal. The Gondal stories have not survived in book form, and most of our knowledge of them comes from Emily's poetry. Emily was a very private person, and she kept her poetry to herself. In 1845, however, Charlotte discovered some poetry manuscripts in a drawer, and provoking her sister's fury, she read them. Later, Charlotte was to write, They were not common effusions, not at all like the poems women generally write. I thought them condensed and terse, vigorous and genuine. To my ear, they also had a peculiar music, wild, melancholy and elevating. This cache of manuscripts contains some of the best poems of the 19th century. Charlotte persuaded Emily to join her and Anne in publishing a book of poems. Emily eventually agreed, insisting on protecting her anonymity by the use of pseudonyms, Currer, Ellis and Acton Bell. This was the first use of the famous nom de plume. The book was favourably reviewed and sold two copies. There has been much speculation about the origin of the pseudonyms, which are, it seems to me, androgynous rather than overtly masculine, casting doubt over the sister's gender rather than denying it. Male or female was part of the puzzle they set. Where did they come from? One explanation of Emily's pseudonym, Ellis, is that it was the name of a local mill owner. Another is that it was the name of a Halifax Member of Parliament. But for me, the most convincing is a literary source. In 1814, Fanny Burney wrote The Wanderer, which we do not know if Emily ever read. However, there is a character in this book whose name Emily might well have been tempted to borrow if she had read it, as it resonates with her own gondol stories. In her diary, Emily writes of visiting York with her sister Anne and spending the time re-enacting a gondol tale in their heads in which they are royalist prisoners escaping from a republican prison. The heroine of the Wanderer is on the run from French revolutionaries and to hide her identity changes her name to Ellis. And of course Ellis is a woman. Before we look at more of the poems it might be interesting to spend a bit of time on the manuscripts. Their history is quite complicated. Emily selected 21 poems for the book published with her sisters from two notebooks, which she had begun transcribing poems into in 1844. Six from the notebooks she called Gondel Poems, and 15 from a notebook now known as the Honrisfelt Manuscript, named after the house of Sir Alfred Law in Lancashire. She removed all references to Gondel from the Gondel Poems notebook when selecting the poems for publication in 1846. This manuscript is now in the British Museum. The Honrisfelt manuscript was last located in the collection of Sir Alfred Law, but it is now missing. Fortunately, a facsimile was made for a Shakespeare head edition in 1934. These images are some of the 50 plus manuscripts we have in the Parsonage Library. Emily had a habit of writing several poems on one small piece of paper, sometimes dividing one poem from another by a dotted line, sometimes not. 
Sometimes she dated a poem, sometimes she didn't, and sometimes, as we have seen, she dated the piece of paper with several poems on it, leading to the question, were they all written at the same time? They must be an editor's nightmare, or a gift, depending on your point of view. You can find more information about the manuscripts in the introduction to The Penguin Classics Emily Bronte The Complete Poems. I first read Emily's poems in a small collection which I spotted in the museum shop. Until then I had thought of Emily as a great novelist who had written some poetry. Now I think of her as preeminently a poet who also wrote a great novel. First I read The Night is Darkening Round Me and I was intrigued by the mysterious context of the poem. The night is darkening round me, the wild winds coldly blow, but a tyrant spell has bound me, and I cannot, cannot go. The giant trees are bending, their bare boughs weighed with snow, and the storm is fast descending, and yet I cannot go. Clouds beyond clouds above me, wastes beyond wastes below, but nothing drear can move me, I will not, cannot go. I was struck by the defiance of the line, will not, cannot go. Suddenly the inability to leave, the cannot, becomes a refusal, a will not, a defiance of the storm or death, or whatever threat is approaching. Then I read the night wind and I was captivated. The poem begins with a quiet domestic scene which sounds autobiographical, the poet Emily sitting in the parlour in the moonlight, a gentle wind blowing through the open window. In summer's mellow midnight a cloudless moon shone through our open parlour window and rose trees wet with dew. I sat in silent musing, the soft wind waved my hair, it told me heaven was glorious and sleeping earth was fair. After the first two verses, we seem to be reading a fairly conventional 19th century poem echoing a comforting Christian message. It told me heaven was glorious and sleeping earth was fair. Then the wind becomes a character in the poem, and when it begins to speak, it undermines the conventional reassuring message. I needed not its breathing to bring such thoughts to me, but still it whispered lowly how dark the woods will be. The thick leaves in my murmur are rustling like a dream, and all their myriad voices instinct with spirit seem. Notice how the leaves are instinct with spirit. So any spirituality is not coming from a Christian God, but from nature. The wind speaks temptingly, and in the seventh verse erotically, and the poet attempts to resist. I said, Go, gentle singer, thy wooing voice is kind, but do not think its music has power to reach my mind. Play with the scented flower, the young tree's supple bough, and leave my human feelings in their own course to flow. The wanderer would not leave me, its kiss grew warmer still. Oh, come, it sighed so sweetly, I'll win thee against thy will. Have we not been from childhood friends? Have I not loved thee long, as long as thou hast loved the night whose silence wakes my song? And when thy heart is laid at rest beneath the churchyard stone, I shall have time enough to mourn, and thou to be alone. Is the poet's resistance successful? We are not told. This not saying is a technique often used by Emily in her poetry, and in Wuthering Heights of course, where does Heathcliff go during his absence? Another effect often present in the poems is the tension between threat and liberation. Is the wind offering freedom and excitement? Does it represent imagination or inspiration? Or is it a threat? Is it death? Something else we notice is the minimal punctuation, and I will return to this important aspect of Emily's poetry later. Emily does not hold up her thoughts with full stops and commas, 
and this freedom allows the wind's persuasive voice to gather urgency as it tempts the poet or reader out of the security of the parlour. There is a comparison to be made with Keats' Ode to a Nightingale, in which the poet is tempted to follow the bird, but recognises that where it's leading may be towards oblivion, which has a strange attraction. Darkling I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death. After reading this, I bought the complete poems, and that same will not of the night is darkening round me became apparent in many other poems as a strong, pervading sentiment. It is as though Emily is saying, I will not accept the beliefs of my father, or of the people who attend the church in front of my house. I will not bend my knee to what society and the established church tell me I should believe, and I will not act in the way they tell me I should act. Charlotte said of Emily that the best way to persuade her in favour of an opinion was to argue the opposite. But Emily's poetry is much more than a negative, contrary reaction to another's point of view. Because every will not expressed in the poems presupposes a will. And what Emily says she will do in her poems is express her innermost thoughts in the tradition of the romantic poets with no fear of the censorship of others. Above all, what Emily will do is search for personal liberty and claim it as a right wherever she finds it. But what did Emily mean by liberty? Certainly not the freedom to travel. By all accounts, she was miserable when away from home. A gap year would have had no attraction for Emily. The poems tell us. First, it's the liberty to be found within nature and the poet's own freedom to experience it. High Waving Heather was written when Emily was 18. Here we see nature untamed. The joyful, unpunctuated images tumble into each other and the language reflects brilliantly nature's power and energy. High waving heather neath stormy blasts bending, midnight and moonlight and bright shining stars, darkness and glory rejoicingly blending, earth rising to heaven and heaven descending, man's spirit away from the drear dungeon sending, bursting the fetters and breaking the bars, all down the mountainsides, wild forests lending one mighty voice to the life-giving wind, rivers their banks in the jubilee rending, fast through the valleys a reckless course wending, wider and deeper their waters extending, leaving a desolate desert behind, shining and lowering and swelling and dying, changing forever from midnight to noon, roaring like thunder, like soft music sighing, shadows on shadows advancing and flying, lightning, bright flashes, the deep gloom defying, coming as swiftly and fading as soon. It's a poem about the liberty within nature, for although the poet is obviously observing or imagining the scene, it's as though she's not there. Nature is unmediated by human presence. Also, the rapidity with which one image runs into the other blurs the boundaries between heather, wind, moonlight, stars and water. So not so much a description of separate entities colliding as a dramatic interweaving of essences. Yes, Emily was often in charge of household duties at the parsonage, but she was free to leave the house frequently and at length to experience untamed nature on her doorstep. High Waving Heather is one of Emily's earliest dated poems, written on the 13th of December, 1836. And in most later nature poems, she does include a human presence, often the poet's voice in dialogue with nature, as we saw in The Night Wind. Often, the poetic voice is that of a wanderer. And there's something of the wandering poet of the romantic tradition in Emily, we can compare her in this respect with Rousseau, Goethe and Wordsworth. How far did Emily's communication with nature go? Wanderer or mystic? There is certainly more to Emily's poetry than descriptions of the surface of things. This is the 18th century philosopher Rousseau. And this is him describing what sounds like a suspension of personality as he communes with nature. It's a feeling we can often detect 
in Emily's poetry. There are several passages which seem to go beyond observing and describing nature into something deeper, as if the observation had moved to a different level. And these passages have led some people to claim Emily as a mystic, a poet who actually experienced visions and then wrote about them later in Tranquility. Her first poem, which could arguably be describing the onset of a mystical experience, is And First an Hour of Mournful Musing, written in 1837. There's certainly a sense of ecstasy in the second verse, with an erotic suggestion, and then a throb, and then a lightning, and then a breathing from above, and then a star in heaven brightening, the star, the glorious star of love. This effect is still there in 1844. In a daydream, the poet, wandering the moors, it's tempting to say just for a change, is resting on a sunny bank. It's early summer and nature is beautiful, but the poet is struck with melancholy at the thought that winter follows summer and the present will be lost in the future. We pick up the poem where nature suddenly fragments into thousands of divine sparks, which speak to her. A thousand thousand gleaming fires seemed kindling in the air. A thousand thousand silvery lyres resounded far and near. Methought the very breath I breathed was, was full of sparks divine, and all my heather couch was wreathed by that celestial shine. And while the wide earth echoing rung to their strange minstrelsy, the little glittering spirits sung, or seemed to sing, to me. And could we lift the veil, and give one brief, brief glimpse of thine eye, thou wouldst rejoice for those that live, because they live to die. The image of the veil suggests a deeper reality behind lived reality, that the most a person can hope for is a suggestion of a glimpse behind the veil. And could we lift the veil? The veil points to the influence of Shelley, who also used the image to refer to deeper realities. In 1845, Emily wrote The Prisoner. Again, there is a description of a vision. It's a gondol poem. Yes, Emily was still gondoling in 1845, in which a female prisoner in a dungeon escapes physical confinement by what sounds like an out-of-body experience. But first, a hush of peace, a soundless calm descends. The struggle of distress and fierce impatience ends. Mute music soothes my breast, unuttered harmony that I could never dream till earth was lost to me. Then dawns the invisible, the unseen its truth reveals. My outward sense is gone, my inward essence feels. Its wings are almost free, its home, its harbour found. Measuring the gulf, it stoops and dares the final bound. Oh, dreadful is the check, intense the agony, when the ear begins to hear and the eye begins to see. When the pulse begins to throb, the brain to think again, the soul to feel the flesh and the flesh to feel the chain. Notice the sudden drawing back. What lies behind the veil cannot be fully revealed. The check comes as she dares the final bound. One critic has said the lines were written by someone accustomed to mystical experience and accustomed to a feeling of the loss of self in creative identification. Another claims the passage as a description of a supreme mystic experience, of the joy of outward flight, the pain of the return. You can't talk of mysticism in poetry without mentioning William Blake. It's generally accepted that Emily could not have been influenced by Blake because his work wasn't generally known until after her death. But strangely, passages like these do chime with Blake who, who claims to have literally seen angels sitting in trees. And away from the visions, the misleading simplicity of these lines by Emily, for me, have echoes of Blake. 
A little while, a little while, the noisy crowd are barred away. And I saw thee, child, one summer's day, suddenly leave thy cheerful play, wrote Emily. Remind me of parts of Blake's innocence and experience, such as On a cloud I saw a child, and he laughing said to me, or When the voices of children are heard on the green and laughing is heard on the hill. I think it's possible that Emily had heard of Blake and his work. He had a coterie of friends in London, fellow artists who were aware of his work before it became generally known, and kept it alive in their discussions after his death. Is it too fanciful to think this knowledge filtered through to Emily somehow, perhaps through books or periodicals, since lost, or by word of mouth? If it is, I find it a surprising coincidence of ideas. Was Emily a mystic? Did she have visions or out-of-body experiences? Is there a book to be written entitled Emily Bronte, Astral Traveller? Whether imagined or actually experienced, these written descriptions of visions are some of Emily's most beautiful poetry and say something important about her quest for liberty. Her imagination would not be limited by lived reality, but would look further, behind or beyond. So for Emily, nature wasn't just the sky, stars, trees and heather. Though it was all of these things, it was a veil laid over infinity which only the imagination could attempt to penetrate. This idea of nature being more than physical nature leads us to the second liberty which I believe Emily seeks in her poems, the right to question and sometimes deny conventional religious beliefs. Pantheism was an idea gaining ground in the 18th and 19th centuries. I think both High Waving Heather and The Night Wind show the importance of pantheism in Emily's poetry and that it predominates over expressions of orthodox Christianity which are few. Pantheism is the belief that the universe and nature contain a spiritual essence, that they alone are worthy of the reverence that traditional religions devote to God. It's the belief that nature, or the earth itself, inspires a sense of wonder onto which traditional religions project their imagined deities. Pause over that for a moment. Imagined deities. In other words, not real. Strong stuff for the daughter of a clergyman. In Shall Earth No More Inspire Thee, it is the earth who is speaking, with no comment from the human, the lonely dreamer. Shall earth no more inspire thee, thou lonely dreamer? No, since passion may not fire thee, shall nature cease to bow? The mind is ever moving in regions dark to thee. Recall its useless roving. Come back and dwell with me. I know my mountain breezes enchant and soothe thee still. I know my sunshine pleases despite thy wayward will. Then let my winds caress thee, thy comrade let me be. Since naught beside can bless thee, return and dwell with me. Juliet Barker believes the poem shows Emily's pantheism in its most extreme form. Mother Earth is persuading the lonely dreamer to return to her because only she can provide a blessing. Since naught beside can bless thee, return and dwell with me. There is no Christian God here. Indeed, in 19th century terms, it's close to blasphemy. I See Around Me, Tombstone's Grey, is another explicitly pantheistic poem in which the rejection of the Christian God goes further. The opening sounds autobiographical, the view from the parsonage. I see around me tombstones grey, stretching their shadows far away. Beneath the turf my footsteps tread, lie low and lone the silent dead. Beneath the turf, beneath the mould, forever dark, forever cold. There is no Christian heaven here. The dead are underground, lone and silent. The next lines. And heaven itself, so pure and blessed, could never give my spirit rest. 
remind us of Cathy's speech in Wuthering Heights when she says she would be unhappy in heaven. And at the end, she's asking Mother Earth what can give her comfort and answering, thy children's love. The, the Christian message of humanity as God's children is replaced by humanity as the children of Mother Earth. And surely no dazzling land above goes beyond irony. It's sarcasm. The last three lines are clearly pantheistic. Let us be laid in lasting rest, awaken but to share with thee a mutual immortality. There is no afterlife, or if there is, it's within the earth. In I'm Happiest When Most Away, the visionary Emily and the pantheistic Emily are one and the same. The poem is also often cited as a description of an out-of-body experience, while showing that nature and the universe provide everything required for fulfilment and liberty. I'm happiest when most away, I can bear my soul from its home of clay, on a windy night when the moon is bright, and my eye can wander through worlds of light, when I am not and none beside, nor earth, nor sea, nor cloudless sky, but only spirit wandering wide through infinite immensity. There is no sense of an observer on the one hand and nature on the other. They are the same thing. The poet is nature. Nature is the poet, when I am not and none beside. She is not separate from the moon, the light, the clouds. So Emily claimed the right to move away from orthodox Christianity. In some poems, she went further. There are examples of criticism, even denial of orthodox Christian ideas of her father's religion. <clears throat> Part of the poem, My Comforter, sounds like a description of a church service by someone who hasn't much time for such gatherings. Emily was apparently a reluctant member of the congregation. Around me, wretches uttering praise, or howling o'er their hopeless days, and each with frenzied tongue, a brotherhood of misery, their smiles as sad as sighs, whose madness daily maddened me, distorted into agony the bliss before my eyes. She sets the Christian church against her own deity, nature, and makes an important statement in not choosing heaven over hell, but accepting both. Nature and the individual soul can encompass everything. So stood I in heaven's glorious sun and in the glare of hell, my spirit drank a mingled tone of seraph's song and demon's moan. What my soul bore, my soul alone within itself may tell. In the philosopher, the poet longs to sleep without identity. She does not fear hell because her will is stronger and heaven is inadequate to encompass human desires. Oh, for the time when I shall sleep without identity, and never care how rain may steep or snow may cover me. No promised heaven these wild desires could all or half fulfil. No threatened hell with quenchless fires subdue this quenchless will. Gilbert and Gubar, in their book The Mad Woman in the Attic, describe this passage wonderfully as the quenchless and impious will that stalks through Wuthering Heights. In a death scene, a dying lover is urged not to cross the eternal sea, to death, because there is no heaven waiting, and when death inevitably arrives, there is no hope of resurrection. It's final. So I knew that he was dying, stooped and raised his languid head, felt no breath and heard no sighing, so I knew that he was dead. No Coward Soul is Mine, written in 1846, is one of Emily's last poems before she devoted her time to Wuthering Heights, and it's one of the last she ever wrote, so it's tempting to look on it as some kind of final statement. Personally, I don't think this is helpful because Emily presumably planned to return to her poetry after Wuthering Heights, but if not final, it certainly sounds like a statement, and a powerful one. 
No coward soul is mine, no trembler in the world's storm-troubled sphere. I see heaven's glory shine, and faith shines equal, arming me from fear. O God within my breast, almighty, ever-present deity, life, that in me hast rest, as I undying life have power in thee. Vain are the thousand creeds that move men's hearts, unutterably vain, worthless as withered weeds, or idlest froth amid the boundless main. To waken doubt in one, holding so fast by thy infinity, so surely anchored on the steadfast rock of immortality. With wide embracing love, thy spirit animates eternal years, pervades and broods above, changes, sustains, dissolves, creates and rears. Though earth and moon were gone, and suns and universes ceased to be, and thou wert left alone, every existence would exist in thee. There is not room for death, nor atom that his might could render void, since thou art being and breath, and what thou art may never be destroyed. It's sometimes taken, correctly I think, as evidence that Emily was not an out-and-out -out atheist, despite her criticisms of the Christian Church. The evidence for atheism comes partly from the influence on her work of Shelley, who was. But if disbelief in a Christian God makes someone an atheist, then Emily was one. There is a God in the poem, but I think it's one consistent with the pantheistic spirit God present in many of Emily's other poems. It's a God inside Emily, within her breast, not the orthodox patriarchal dispenser of divine justice to the deserving. In fact, it's very difficult to, def to find a hint of that kind of God anywhere in Emily's work. For me, Stevie Davis in Emily Bronte Heretic hits the nail on the head when describing the kind of divinity Emily adhered to. God the Father she condemned. All that was truly divine was located in the mother planet and its daughter, the self. Notice how the absence of punctuation allows us to connect deity with life in the second verse. I've always read this as deity life, that they're one and the same. But in that case, who is thee at the end of the verse? I think, in the context of the whole poem, thee is everything. There is not room for death, because death is only one element of the whole, and the condemnation of religious doctrine in the third verse is Emily's comment on the, as she saw it, pathetic attempt by humans to put a name to the mysterious, all-pervading spirit that she identified in nature. I've searched through Emily's poems and I can't find any other opening line with the power of no coward soul is mine. It grabs you and pulls you out of your seat. It's so strong that it floats free of the poem and makes us think of other things we know of Emily. Why is this? The editor of the Penguin Classics Complete Poems, Janet Gazari, believes the line to be an ultimatum and one recognised by Charlotte after her sister's discovery and reading of Emily's poems without permission in 1845. No Coward Soul was written shortly after this event. Is Emily saying, don't do anything like that again, you've been warned? Or is it a response to a possible remark made by one of her sisters about needing courage to publish? The line is also a fitting description of Emily's own writing, to the things she was not afraid to say. To her poems, which criticised the Christian church, made fun of it even, remember the sarcastic, no dazzling heaven above? and those which expanded her nature poetry into descriptions of visions. And it's especially appropriate to Wuthering Heights with its violence, brutality and unchristianity. Emily would have had to have been unworldly in the extreme not to anticipate the furor in the literary establishment caused by this novel. She did not write Wuthering Heights or many of her poems to be popular with the establishment. She wrote them because this was the direction in which her art was taking her. This took courage. And we can also relate that opening line to what we know of her life, her refusal to acknowledge social norms, to dress in the way people expected, for example, or even to speak to people she didn't like, and of what we know about the tremendously courageous way she met her own death. In and out of the poem, we know that Emily was no coward, no trembler in the world's storm-troubled sphere. So no co coward soul is mine, 
has become a totemic line for Emily, as well as the opening of one of her most powerful poems. This image is of no coward soul, as Emily wrote it. This is a picture of a 19th century corset. It's what Charlotte enclosed the poem in when she published it posthumously in 1850 in a new edition of Wuthering Heights. Emily had died in 1848. What do you notice? This brings me to the third liberty I would like to talk about. The liberty to write verse freely. Disburdened by the corset of 19th century punctuation, Emily was a 19th century pioneer of 20th century free verse. Try reading Emily's version aloud, then Charlotte's heavily punctuated version. In the original version, words and images suggest their own rhythm. Charlotte's interference is unnecessary. It imposes an alien rhythm instructing the reader where to pause and stop. It also introduces a kind of pomposity which is completely absent in the original. Look at the second verse in which the exclamation mark at the end of the second line makes Emily's God sounds like a, sound like a bearded Old Testament prophet rather than Emily's private God within her breast. Most of Charlotte's punctuation is stopping punctuation. Full stops, colons, exclamation marks. It prevents the images from running into each other, which I believe Emily intended, and hinders the reader in making different connections at each reading. It reduces ambiguity and tells us what to think. In the second verse there is no longer any conflation between deity and life, as in the original. There is deity and there is life, two entirely different things according to Charlotte, but not to Emily. Charlotte didn't stop at punctuation, she also altered the words to ensure a clearer Christian message. In the next to last verse, she has replaced Emily's capital E of Earth with the lowercase, probably to avoid the reader linking Earth with a deity, Emily's pantheistic deity. And when in the final verse, Charlotte changes since thou art being and breath to thou, thou art being and breath, and repeats the capitalised thou in the last line, she is making sure there can be no confusion between the Christian God and the pantheistic spirit God, or a God residing only in Emily's breast. Charlotte is on a Christianising mission. It has to be said that Emily did punctuate her own poems for the 1846 edition, but in my view this was to satisfy the expectations of the reading public, not because she thought that speckling her poems with full stops and commas improved them, Emily's poems work better without punctuation. I'd like to quote Stevie Davis again when she says the unpunctuated lines flow like a mighty wind annihilating boundaries between self and word. Charlotte took her editor's pen to most of Emily's posthumously published poems. The night wind was a major sufferer. Again the punctuation attempts to parcel up the images and pin down the meaning. While in the last verse there is a moving touch from Charlotte, changing the location of Emily's burial place from Churchyard Stone to Church Isle Stone to reference Emily's actual resting place, she returns to Charlotte the censor, italicising I and thou to avoid any pantheistic idea that the poet and the wind could be one and the same. So why did Charlotte do this to her sister's work? Partly, I think, it was to satisfy Emily's readers. Unlike today's readers of poetry who are used to unpunctuated verse, ambiguity and meanings that resist definition, 19th century readers were more used to clearly separated images and clearly signalled ideas. But I think there was another reason behind Charlotte's editing. I think she Christianised No Coward Soul and The Night Wind, insisting that the God in the poems was the orthodox Christian one to protect her sister. Charlotte had come to see herself as the guardian of Emily's moral reputation, which had taken something of a battering after Wuthering Heights was published. So the editing was, I think, partly out of love for her sister, but it damages the poems. It was an expression of sisterly love, which Emily would not have appreciated. Of course, there is much more to Emily Bronte's poetry than the three aspects of liberty I have talked about. There is the Gothic, for example, which is very important and, and which I haven't mentioned. 
This has been a personal view of Emily's poetry, focused on liberty because this leapt out at me as soon as I began to read, and drew me deeper into the poems the more of them I read. I'd like to finish with a short poem, written when Emily was 22, which shows how important the pursuit and expression of liberty were to Emily's work and life. Liberty was, as Charlotte said, the very breath of her nostrils. Without it, she perished. The Old Stoic Riches I hold in light esteem, and love I laugh to scorn, and lust of fame was but a dream that vanished with the morn. And if I pray, the only prayer that moves my lips for me is leave the heart that now I bear, and give me liberty. Yes, as my swift days near their goal, tis all that I implore, in life and death a chainless soul with courage to endure.